Hi, my name is Matt Ozalis, and I'm an RF engineer at Keysight Technologies. In today's short video, I'll go over how to design a Class F power amplifier. The objectives of my presentation are first to review some of the basic theory behind this circuit, and then to build a simple nonlinear transistor model to illustrate the mechanism by which a Class F amplifier works. And from there, we'll look at both an ideal Class F PA topology and also a more practical high-frequency circuit implementation. Now, the material in this video is built upon concepts and techniques which I covered in two earlier videos, and you can watch them at the links below. These really provide the basic building blocks that I'm going to use today to put together this Class F power amplifier. And at the end of this video, I'll also show you how to download a workspace which contains all of the designs that I'm going to cover today, for example, demonstrating the square Class F waveforms that allow for such a big improvement in performance over the other modes of operation. First, I'd like to review the basic theory of operation for a power amplifier. Now, since power is dissipated whenever sinusoidal voltage and current waveforms overlap in time, we can improve the efficiency for a PA by adjusting the bias of the transistor to rectify the current waveform. And this changes the class of operation, which improves efficiency and lowers the gain. Now, if we create a half-rectified current waveform, that's called class B, and the ideal efficiency for this mode is 78.5%. So further rectifying the signal from here usually drops the gain too much to be useful. So another approach to improve efficiency is to use the harmonic terminations to shape the waveform. So for example, if we make the voltage a square wave, this could give us up to 100% efficiency ideally, and that's called class F operation. Now before I go about uh, creating this square wave, I want to review a basic concept which I use all the time in my PA design work, and that's called the trigonometric Fourier series. Basically, any periodic signal can be expressed as a sum of sinusoidal components at different frequencies with a DC term and integer harmonic terms. And we can find the harmonic terms by integrating the function multiplied by a harmonic sine or cosine signal in the time domain over a fundamental period, which is the lowest frequency that occurs in the signal that we're analyzing. So, for example, I could decompose a partially rectified sine wave into harmonic terms at each frequency, and from that information, the signal could then be reconstituted. So let me show you an easy way to create a square wave using this concept. Here I'll combine two sinusoidal voltage waveforms using an ideal power combiner. And one waveform is at 1 gigahertz, and another waveform is going to be at 3 gigahertz, which is, of course, the third harmonic. And this should be out of phase with the fundamental. So now I'll run the simulation, and the output is a combination of these two signals, and the waveform definitely has a square characteristic to it. So adding odd harmonics with the correct phase causes the sinusoidal waveform to become square. And also the more harmonics that I add, the better approximation of a square wave that I'll get. Okay, so now let's take a look at a transistor to see where these harmonics are going to come from to build a square wave. So to make an ideal transistor, basically, I took a linear gain block and added some large signal elements. These usually generate the harmonics in a power amplifier. The important nonlinearities that I'm showing in this model are regions where the device turns on and off, which happens at both the input and the output. And these functions were implemented in the simulator using simple building blocks, so I cascaded this set of functions together as an ideal transistor in a power amplifier circuit. So I want to start with a class B power amplifier, and I can simulate this with my transistor model by setting the input bias to zero, and then I'll also sweep the input power. Now in the data display, I'm then able to adjust the input power with the slider, and I can look at the gain, the power, the efficiency, and also the voltage and current waveforms and the load line at the device, as well as the spectrum for voltage and current, and also the fundamental and harmonic impedances at the device. Now, at the input power where the load line hits the knee voltage, you can see that I do indeed get an efficiency of 78.5%, which is the theoretical limit for Class B. Now, to get this, all of the harmonics need to be short circuits, so all of the harmonic content appears in the current waveform. In other words, there's, there's no harmonic content in the voltage waveform. So to square the voltage waveform, I should be able to convert the odd harmonics from the current waveform to the voltage waveform using an impedance. But it turns out that for this Class B case, the current waveform, even though they're, you know, it's a very nonlinear waveform, it contains almost no odd harmonic components. The levels are 60 or even 70 dB below the fundamental, which is basically zero. So I actually can't make a square wave from the waveform that I'm showing here. Now, let me illustrate how to use Fourier analysis to prove this. So I'm going to decompose this rectified waveform using the trigonometric Fourier series. And to do that, I need to calculate the Fourier coefficients. So I'll start by expressing the waveform in the time domain. For half the period, it's a scaled cosine function. 
And for the other half where the cosine would normally go negative, it's zero. So to get the appropriate Fourier coefficients, I integrate the signal over the region where it's non-zero, and here that's half the cosine cycle from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. And by the way, since the function I'm deconstructing is a pure cosine, the Fourier sine term, b, is always going to be zero. So I found the solution to this integral in a lookup table, and it's just a sum of two harmonically dependent sinusoids. And for each harmonic, I plug in the appropriate value for n, and then I evaluate the solution. And I did this for both the second harmonic and the third harmonic, and it clearly shows that the second harmonic term is, of course, non-zero, while the third harmonic, and in fact all of the odd harmonics, are zero for this half-rectified cosine wave. So it's a little bit surprising, but the harmonics we need are not going to come from the transistor rectifying the input signal. Okay, so what about the transistor's output knee voltage? That's the other nonlinearity here. Well, for my class B amplifier, I can increase the power by sliding the slider to the right, and when I do that, my load line hits the knee region at the output, and the current waveform crashes down towards zero. So, in effect, the transistor turns off past that point. But look at what happens to the odd harmonic content in the current waveform in the knee region. All of a sudden, the signal contains a bunch of odd harmonics. So again, we can analyze this using Fourier series, and to do this, I'll just use a crude knee model by assuming the current waveform goes to zero whenever the voltage waveform goes below zero. And so I get this chopped up cosine wave for the current because the voltage goes below zero when the current is at its peak. Now, I just chose some arbitrary limits here around zero to denote the area where the current waveform gets chopped up. This is just to make a point. Now, to find the harmonic coefficients, all I need to do is change my integration limits a little bit from the last case. And this requires me to solve the integral in two distinct parts, the left half and the right half, and then add these parts together. And when I do this, all of a sudden my third harmonic component becomes non-zero and negative, or 180 degrees out of the phase with the fundamental. So now I've proven that the transistor's knee region is really what generates the odd harmonics for a class FPA. And one thing that's a little problematic with the math here is that if you extend this analysis to the fifth harmonic, it's also out of phase with the fundamental. And it turns out that this is not very good for making a square wave. So maybe we still can't make a, a higher order square wave from this, and I'll, I'll talk about that more in a minute. So in my simulation, I have a load set up here, which allows me to arbitrarily change the impedance for the fundamental, along with any of the first 15 harmonics. And so with this, I can easily achieve a resistive third harmonic termination by just setting a variable. And I'm going to leave the rest of the harmonics shorted, and then I'll run the simulation, and I'll compare that back to my original class B baseline. So first of all, the efficiency improves by well over 10% just from changing the one harmonic termination. And also, I can get more linear output power around the knee region. So as I increase the power a little bit further, the current waveform is going to start to become clipped in the knee region. But this happens in a very different way than we assumed in the analysis before, which is why my power is higher. So why is the current waveform here different from the Class B case? Why doesn't the current crash into the knee region like it did before? Well, again, I'll turn to Fourier analysis to shed some light on this. So as in the last case, I'll assume a simple knee model where the current snaps to zero whenever the voltage goes below zero. And now we'll add in a third harmonic voltage. So as the voltage waveform approaches zero, the third harmonic kind of shoots up and pulls the center of the sinusoid away from zero. And so you get kind of a milder encroachment on the knee region. Now, I made the simplistic assumption that a square wave tends to have two minima around the zero crossings of the third harmonic signal. And if I make that assumption, it'll lead to three distinct regions in the current waveform. And to evaluate this, I assumed an arbitrary width zero region like before, and then I just adjusted the integration limits and solved separately for each of these three sections, and then I added the results together. And most importantly, I now get an in-phase coefficient for the fifth harmonic, which is perfect for making a square wave. Now, of course, the waveform that I showed in my simulation wasn't chopped up quite as cleanly as the waveform that I have here. In a single-tone PA, harmonics tend to decrease at higher frequencies, so if you just apply a low-pass filter to this signal, then you can get the exact shape that I had in the simulation. So this analysis approach can be extended to higher and higher frequencies as well. For example, if I now terminate the fifth harmonic of the PA and run the simulation, then as I approach the knee region, the current will clip into four distinct lobes, which will then create an in-phase seventh harmonic component, and I can again convert that to voltage and further square the waveform. So as I continue to shape the voltage waveform, the current waveform then gives me the next harmonic to use, which turns out to be phased correctly. And as I add more of these harmonics, the efficiency of the amplifier will increase until eventually I would get 100% efficiency with using infinite harmonics. And that would be, of course, a perfect square wave. 
Okay, so now you understand exactly how a transistor's knee region can be manipulated to generate a square voltage waveform and a clipped sinusoidal current waveform, and this is the essence of Class F power amplifier operation. Now one lesson is if you're picking a transistor technology to use for a Class F design, look closely at the knee region if you want to maximize performance. Now there are a lot of textbook circuit configurations which involve presenting harmonic impedances externally to the device to terminate all of the harmonics properly. So a quarter wave line is often used as an example to do this. And practically speaking, this topology can be pretty difficult to realize at higher frequencies. And let me illustrate this for you. So let's say that at 10 gigahertz, I'm using a device with parasitics that include a parallel capacitance and a series inductance. And let's say that these parasitics have values of 4 tenths of a puff and 1 tenth of a nanohenry. Well, if I present my external load to this, which has uh, opens at the third and fifth harmonics and shorts at the second and fourth, and rerun the simulation, it turns out that uh, the results that I get show the performance, especially efficiency, is going to be degraded. That the waveforms certainly don't look correct. So wh what's going on here? Well, the parasitics of the device have acted to shift the harmonic terminations so that the, um, at the current generator of the transistor, they're no longer opens and shorts. And even if I tuned one of these back to where it should be, this tuning would further shift the other harmonics out of place. So even small parasitics make idealized class F design tough at higher frequencies. So how can we deal with this? Well, one way is to pick a circuit topology which actually uses the device parasitics as part of the harmonic termination network. So at the fundamental, we use a, a simple low-pass match to cancel out the reactive part of the load, while the series parasitic inductance is incorporated into a second harmonic short, and the parallel parasitic capacitance resonates with that external short to present a high impedance termination to the third harmonic. And here's a paper which uses this technique at KU band to demonstrate a class F mode in a PHAMP process. Turns out that the LC values from this network are quite realizable at that frequency. So I'll briefly show you how to implement a matching network like this in the design tool. Here's my first pass cut of this topology from the design equations, and the impedances look about correct at the harmonics, but still the fundamental impedance needs to be matched to 20 ohms. So on the Smith chart, I can easily design an LC low pass matching network to transform the reactive fundamental impedance back to the ideal value of 20 ohms. But the problem is the addition of this matching network then works to shift the harmonic traps a little bit. So second's no longer a perfect short, the third's no longer an open. So I need to re-optimize the circuit. And I'll do this by setting up a few components for automatic optimization. And then I put in a few simple goals to get all of my harmonic impedances correct, including the fundamental. And I reran the optimizer to give me a, a matching network which hits all of these design targets. Okay, so now I'll, I'll take this network and I will drop it into the class FPA topology and then I will rerun the simulation. So even though the load line at the external package looks distorted, that's the pink load line here, internally at the current source where it matters, the red load line looks very much class F and that leads to high efficiency, even though it would not be obvious that it is gonna be a high efficiency amplifier by looking at the extrinsic node of the device. Okay, well, hopefully this video has given you an appreciation for the challenges involved in realizing a Class F power amplifier. But the good news is you can get a lot of improvement in efficiency with just a few harmonic terminations, and setting up the basic simulations to design the circuit isn't all that hard. To get you jump-started with Class F PA design, you can download my workspace at the link shown here, which has all of the setups and data displays that I've used in this video. And it will give you a good starting point and hopefully a deeper understanding of how Class F power amplifiers really work. And you can experiment with and change the device model I have, or you can even put in your own model, uh, try setting the different harmonic impedances and you can add parasitics, or even implement the circuit that I showed you in the video using real physical structures to see how the performance is impacted by that. So check out the workspace and have fun designing. Thanks for listening.